Uh, this is actually chapter 9 because we uh, put chapter 10 in to do the vapor cycle analysis, so that would make sense for the uh, uh, plant trip we did. So now we'll go back to uh, 9 and do gas cycle ana analysis. If you remember from the plant trip, there were actually two power plants running. Well, they weren't running that day we were there. But when that plant is running, there's actually two power plants running. The gas, the, the vapor cycle is the type we looked at before, and that's the steam turbine that he had out for us to take a look at. But the heat supply to that was coming from the waste heat from a gas turbine cycle uh, that was used. It's called a topping cycle uh, that supplies the heat to the vapor cycle. We'll look at that on Friday. Um, for today, though, we'll look at two types of gas cycles. Both of them are very, very closely uh, associated in how the general things work. It's where, in the specifics, where they differ. Um, you know both of these cycles. Uh, the auto cycle is this. The cycle that is uh, that the, your car engine runs on, unless of course you have a diesel engine, in which case it's the diesel cycle. But they only differ a little bit in their in their particulars in terms of what goes on. The general idea is that we have a piston uh, and cylinder here. In that cylinder, well, at some time, of course, there must be a mixture of air and fuel. Generally, that occurs when the cycle, the, that is intake, uh, that is drawn into the cylinder as the piston moves down the cylinder, moves out of the cylinder, that action actually pulls in the air and the fuel. Uh, well, <coughs> fuel is a little more, more actively injected nowadays with fuel injectors, but in general the fuel is pulled in, the air and the fuel is pulled in as the cylinder moves down, as the piston moves down the cylinder. Shortly after, the piston pushes back up into the cylinder, compressing this air and fuel mixture. The action of the piston moving up the cylinder comes from the fact that it's attached to other cylinders, other pistons in other cylinders that are in the act of moving down and it's uh, the part of the work of those cylinders goes to the compression of the gas and the, the air and the fuel in this cylinder during this stroke. And that's why all gasoline engines and cars are uh, well, at least two cycle, or uh, uh, sorry, uh, two pistons. Um, I don't think there are any two piston cars. I think even the Car is a four cylinder engine. Subaru was a three cylinder. Um, uh, the early Saabs used to be three cylinder. What other ones are? Uh, Subaru had a three cylinder. Subaru? Yeah, it's like a little hatchback. Ford, Ford, just, Ford just came out with a three cylinder. Engine. Yeah. I think smart cars are three cylinders. Yeah. So. Uh, what they're experimenting with is a lot of different layouts of the pistons themselves, <coughs> so it's now possible to get a, a little more, a little more continuity. The the number of cylinders tends to smooth things out. The more cylinders, the more the the more things doing different things at the same time, and so it tends to smooth things out. But also, of course, consumes a lot more fuel. Anyway. Once this fuel-air mixture is compressed, it is then lit by a spark plug, which ignites the fuel, causes the fuel-air mixture to explode, and of course then that drives the piston back down the cylinder as the gas expands greatly. That's the work stroke. But now the cylinder is full of combustion products, which includes, of course, CO2, CO, um, some water. And so 
the piston has to then go back up to expel all of those combustion products at which point then it goes back down the cylinder drawing in fresh air and fuel and the whole thing starts over again. These are fundamentally the four strokes of a four stroke engine which is what um, you know, all car engine that I know of are, are four stroke engines. Um, I don't know if they call Wankel engines four stroke engines but yeah, I, don't know. Yeah, well, I, think so I don't know if they even call them engines anymore. I don't think even Mazda makes that many Wankel engines. No, they're only in the RC. So, anyway, these are the four strokes. The intake stroke that draws in the air and fuel, the compression stroke, the combustion stroke where the work is actually done, and then the uh, stroke where the, the, uh, the exhaust stroke where the, the uh, combustion gases are all pushed out and then it starts over again. So on a PV diagram, looks something like this. Um, it does reach a bottom place where the volume is the greatest. This is called bottom dead center. I'll show you in a little bit why that's considered the bottom of the stroke. When it's at its smallest, uh, highest reach up into the cylinder, that's known as top dead center. And so the piston goes in between those, and the volume then changes between in between each of those. Uh, the air intake is basically something <coughs> where it draws down to uh, bottom dead center, pulling in fuel and air. Then it compresses to top dead center which is about here and then the combustion takes place which is something like that. Generally it happens so quickly that the piston doesn't have time to move yet and of course some of this is idealized and then that pushes, that combustion pushes the piston back down. That's the one work stroke at which point then the gases are exhausted and then goes through the cycle again. The real stroke of course is, is a little bit more rounded off than that. But we can't analyze something like that so we'll break it into fairly distinct uh, fairly distinct processes. In fact what we'll use is what's called an air standard model. These, this is where we'll make a couple assumptions. We'll assume that the working fluid is air and ideal gas. That's good because that gives us an awful lot of nice, easily found and workable equations to analyze all the state points around here. Uh, we, won't, we won't actually model the combustion. We don't have at this time any model, any way to model that. So uh, the combustion will be a constant volume heat addition. And that will be right here uh, at that uh, top part of the uh, so That way we don't have to deal with the changing specific heats of combustion products. The fact that the working fluid itself is changing, we leave it out as an air standard, uh, an air model, and uh, do nothing more with it than that. The exhaust stroke, where the gases are pushed out, we will model as just a simple 
heat rejection. And then all processes are reversible. The only other possible change we'll make to this, and, and we will do this, is if uh, we use what's called a cold air standard model. In that case, we use constant specific heats for the air. Uh, those at room temperature. Not that you run an engine in a room, of course not. With that, uh, those assumptions are diagram becomes something like this. Starting at some chosen point, we have an isentropic compression. That's this stroke as it moves up to point two. No heat exchange at that time. And then the uh, constant volume heat addition causing the cylinder, the piston to move down the cylinder again isentropically. That's the work stroke. Part of the work there goes to pushing the piston other pistons up in their compression stroke. And then there's the exhaust stroke which we model as a heat rejection. So all of those occurring between top dead and bottom dead center as the limits. Associated, the associated TS diagram with that model. One to two is a constant entropy process. That's the compression stroke, remember. Then the heat addition stroke up to three. That models our combustion. Isentropic heat rejection down to point 0.4. I'm oh, sorry, not heat rejection, uh, compression, and then the uh, heat rejection down to point 0.1, and it starts over again. To help you visualize that, have a couple web-based animations. <coughs> and, uh, there'll be a link on Angel to these if you'd like to see them too. You're off duty today. Let's see who else picks it up. If you're going to sit in Kean's seat, you're going to take Kean's job. So get over there and turn off one of the lights. <laughs> <laughs> you can find on on, uh, on Angel. Uh, plus a couple of them lead to almost a hundred different animations of all kinds of different cycles. There's different ways to do this, of course, in terms of how the mechanics is done, but the basic idea is all here. This is just one cylinder running in an auto cycle. This happens to be an overhead cam engine, so the cam that's opening and closing the intake and exhaust valves is up at the top. These are the rocker arms. 
the drive shaft down at the bottom, and you can get an idea of, uh, of how it runs there. So we'll, uh, we'll just start it at one place. This is bottom dead center. Bottom being because the piston is at the bottom of the drive shaft cycle, the circular motion. So we call that bottom dead center where the volume is the greatest. And so let's see, I happen to stop it uh, just after the compression stroke, I think. So notice that as it now starts back up the cylinder, and remember this, the work for this moving back up the cylinder for this bottom process along here, the work for that is coming from the other pistons that are attached to that very same drive shaft. So part of the work they're producing goes to simply pushing out the exhaust and then compressing it uh, a little bit later. So notice here that the uh, exhaust valve has opened because the action of the uh, cam, uh, overhead cam up there and it pushes the rest of the fuel out and then at that time let's see we're back up there uh, once all the exhaust has been pushed out and the piston starts to pull back down then it pulls in fresh fuel and air at that point and returns then of course to bottom dead center at which time the intake valve is shut now it compresses remember this work is coming from the other pistons once it's fully compressed when the piston reaches top dead center which is simply nothing more than a, a, a name referring to just where it is on the drive shaft then you'll notice Oh, you can even see a little bit of the spark right there. It caught it and stop action. Then it, then it explodes. And of course it's red because all explosions are. And then that's the work stroke and that pushes the piston down. So you, uh, you, uh, you don't know how your car engine works. A lot of things you can worry about. Uh, the timing has to do with the, the tune-up, where you get the timing fixed, uh, has to do with just when that spark ignites. If it ignites too early before it's fully compressed or too late, then it adds a lot of inefficiency to the stroke. Um, you may have heard somebody throwing a piston. It's usually because this arm right here breaks and the piston's loose in the cylinder. Oftentimes, uh, can shoot out the top. Um, some some, I think, uh, I can't remember if I have another picture of this. A uh, lot of cars have this cam down at the bottom where long rods go up and push these valves open and shut. Those are known as the push rods here, and you often hear of a bent push rod. Uh, those are known as the rocker arms up there. And then, of course, you buy mobile detergent gasoline to keep those valves clean. Because you can imagine they get a lot of combustion projects on, products on it. And we can match this up with the uh, PV diagram. And you can see there's the uh, intake stroke. Then the compression we model as an isentropic compression. The combustion, which we have to notice that it happens almost instantaneously in our model. Uh, before the volume has any time to change. We model that as just a heat addition and then that pushes the piston back down in the work stroke and then the exhaust stroke and it all starts over again. So the drive shaft revolves around 3,000 times a minute, except on Chris, Chris's car, which is redlined at five, if not seven. Uh, and then there's at least four of these, often um, uh, as much as, what did Jake, 
Isn't there a 16 cylinder Jaguar? Yeah, well, cylinder? so well, maybe. Which? Bugatti also got okay. a six-cylinder. They just take two eights. God, it's like, it's like Bill all of a sudden woke up. That's <laughs> <laughs> you, Kurt. Should have done this the first day. And all that does is divide all of these cycles over different cylinders. So it tends to smooth things out, levels the uh, power output, do something a little more useful. Uh, a simple picture of of uh, that kind of thing is here there's a, a inline four cylinder well I don't know if it's inline or not I can't really tell from the picture uh, inline means all the pistons are in a straight line a V4 is where two of them are put out at a, an angle it just sort of compacts the engine a little bit also uh, tends to smooth out some of the mechanical forces but notice at of the four cylinders, only one is firing at any one time. I wish I could stop this animation or slow it down, but it is kind of a neat one. Uh, only one of the four cylinders is firing at any time. Part of that work goes to both the compression stroke and the exhaust stroke on one of the other cylinders. So, uh, guys, if any of any of you would like to make a neat car engine noise to go along with this, oh, I won't embarrass the women by asking them to do that. I mean, not make car noises. <laughs> See, they don't argue with that. They know it's true. That's a four-stroke engine because of each of these four strokes. Uh, another engine you're very familiar with because it's what's most often the engine used in um, chainsaws and lawnmowers because it can be smaller. It's, it's a little bit more power for the volume, but uh, tends to be a bit dirtier with the emissions and a little less efficient, is the two-stroke engine. <laughs> what? There, there we go. Yeah, engine sounds coming <laughs> What, Bill? Oh. <laughs> Don't make me turn the camera around, Bill. The two-stroke engine uses some of the compression to uh, exchange the exhaust for the fresh and then some of the work to uh, sort of do that in reverse. So you have to follow it along a little bit. Here it's, uh, here it's just starting back up. So now it's compressing the gas, the, the fuel air mixture in the top until it ignites there. This is a yellow flame. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Uh, that's the work stroke. Notice that at this time uh, it had just pulled in some new air fuel here that's now below it. And then as it drops down it starts to push that air fuel mixture up into the top part of the cylinder which pushes the exhaust gases out. This is the the unclean, unenvironmental part of a two-stroke engine because now you have combustion products mixed with fresh air and fuel and so you're just not going to get as efficient uh, combustion with that because you just don't have quite the clean um, system you had. So it tends to, to the new fuels trying to push out the rest of the exhaust and so on. You can see this engine runs a lot slower. Doesn't want to forget it. No. So there's a lot to do. But that's a two-stroke engine because it combines um, the, the exhaust and compression and the uh, intake and the work processes into one. Getting rid of two strokes. Other possible arrangements. Uh, for at least for the auto cycle have to do with more just the arrangement of the pistons, the number of the pistons and the arrangement of the pistons. Um, Subaru has what's called a boxer engine where the two pistons, the two sets of pistons are running out sideways. The, the engine essentially lays flat and then the, end, the pistons are going back and forth uh, in opposite directions like that rather than up and down with each other or kind of up and down in a V-stroke like that.
Keen? Maybe if you had a taser or something, could we see if we can get some work out of him? All right. The uh, the only difference really with a with a diesel cycle, uh, it's a little bit different, but not terribly. A diesel cycle is one where it, there is no um, spark plug in a diesel engine. They use the fact that the air and fuel comes into what is already a pretty hot environment. Uh, the gasoline is specially formulated so that when it's fully compressed, it self-ignites. It, uh, there's auto-ignition and then that's what drives, uh, then the rest of the cycle is essentially the same. Uh, that's part of why especially older diesel engines were hard to start in cold weather because it was hard to get this hot enough when compressed for it to actually ignite. But now they have, uh, I think they're called glow plugs. Mm -hmm. Glow plugs that sort of preheat this mixture so allow the combustion to happen a little bit more efficiently. Uh, for some reason, truck owners still feel they can't turn off their trucks on a cold day at a convenience store. Yeah. But uh, at 15 seconds before it starts, is annoying. Because it God, isn't it though? It's so Because that's 15 seconds it's that the babes aren't looking over at your big throbbing truck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the PV diagram is a little bit different. Everything else is pretty much the same. It's still pistons running in a cylinder, uh, but with a diesel engine, there's still this isentropic compression stroke, and then it's a constant volume. We model it as a constant volume heat addition. That's where the combustion stroke is. And then there's the isentropic uh, work cycle, and then it drops down and then starts all over. So our heat addition is modeled here, and the heat rejection is modeled here. Other than that, they're, they're fairly similar. There are little differences with the analysis that uh, we'll try to get through as we work as we're through that now. We'll focus most of what we're doing on the on the uh, auto cycle. A um, little bit of difference with the diesel cycle, but if we don't quite get to it, it's uh, well done in the book. And most of you drive auto cycles anyway. Except, yeah, everybody's looking at Chris. Wow. Chris has a diesel pickup truck. No? I don't have a pickup truck. You used to have a little veggie car. Diesel go kart? No, oh, veggie car. Veggie car. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. So we'll look at these processes, then we'll see if we got uh, we can get through a uh, a problem or two. So the the First process, one to two, is an isentropic compression. We don't specifically model the intake and outtake strokes because, remember, those, uh, at least in terms of work, have no effect on the cycle, so we don't even bother modeling those. So if we look at a first law setup for that, remember with our model, the air standard cycle, this is taken as a closed system. We're also, of course, assuming that the kinetic energy and the uh, potential energy changes are zero. So for analyzing the first stroke, all we need for the most part is the 
change in the internal energy because uh, as an isentropic process there's no heat transfer. And we can do it on a kilogram basis as well, a mass basis as well. For the cold air standard assumption, uh, remember the internal energy can be looked up on the tables directly if you have enough information. Uh, if not, then you can use the cold air standard assumption which uses the changes in, in uh, internal energy. One thing we can define here, since this is a stroke from bottom dead center to top dead center, to find the compression ratio, which is another one of those terms those car guys like to throw around at the bar. Try to impress people with that. And that's um, V1 divided by V2. Since it's a closed system, that's also the the uh, internal, uh, sorry, the specific volume. And since it's an ideal gas, it's also the reduced volumes. If you remember, that's uh, that's also on the table since as values can be looked up directly. Typically, these go from about 7 to 12 are fa fairly typical numbers, but I'm sure Chris has got something else. I don't even know the compression ratio. I'm sorry, ladies, that you had to hear that. <laughs> Darn. That's, that's gonna, that one clip from the whole semester is going to be on YouTube. That one right there. What? <laughs> what did he say, Paul? I don't know. That's what you said. What I said? That's what he said. Oh, that's what you said. What I said? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It was over my head. Jeez. I hate the last week of the term. I wish last week was the last week of the term. I'd uh, be done with this. All right, process uh, two to three is the constant volume heat addition. As such, there is no work being done. And that's also then uh, simply done as delta U. A lot of these normally we, we could just get off the tables. And it's uh, an easier way to do it. This assumption of cold air standard, uh, kind of a back of the envelope type thing. Then we have the work stroke, which is three to four. And notice, of course, that the compression ratio is the same for that stroke as well. So V1 over V2 equals V4 over V3, etc. And then that stroke's calculated very much the same way as the other isentropic compression. Uh, I guess we'll write it in here. Process what? Three to four is the isentropic work stroke or expansion. <coughs> and then the last one is the return to the original spot. which we 
model is a constant volume heat addition. So uh, that's just uh, once the work is taken out of that term as well as the kinetic and potential energy changes. The only other part we can add to it um, is the efficiency. Defined for the most part in the same way as before net work, the you know, benefit over cost. But since we're doing an idealized engine, we can simplify that a lot. As we have before. Uh, actually, that's not a simplification. That's just true for any one of these cycles. But then the ideal assumption we can use here and base this all simply on the uh, on the temperatures to get an ideal efficiency from that now doing a little bit of algebra on this not to necessarily make it simpler just to put it somewhere where we can redefine things a little bit Pull T1 out of this. And so the top becomes that. Pull T2 out of the bottom. So the bottom becomes this. Now the reason that's useful is because you might remember from some of the ice and, or the uh, ideal gas equations that we had for closed systems. You might remember this kind of thing. I think this is equation 742, but I'm not positive. It'll be in there somewhere. Uh, depending on which book you've got. T1 over T2, which remember is an isentropic process. For isentropic processes, the temperature ratio in um, Kelvin. In Kelvin. But what's rank? No, no. Absolute. I don't know why I couldn't grab that word. Absolute temperature is uh, is that. Those are ideal gas isentropic equation processes. Uh, that right there, if you remember, is 1 over R, the compression ratio. So the efficiency of an auto engine can be reduced to something like a little bit more algebra through there. Reduced to something like like this. K minus one, not one minus three. R to the K minus one power. So it's pretty easy to, to calculate the ideal efficiency based on that. Uh, don't forget that K is the ratio of specific heats. Okay, that's the picture. What we can use to
you must be a truck owner. Ah, I didn't bring the book. It must be a truck owner. Who's got the book? We're going to run again. I need the very end of chapter seven. Oh, right to it. This you you can just use this for reference. Remember, at the end of every chapter, they have kind of a summary of a lot of the. Uh, Equations used. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you didn't really think I was going to take that. No. All right. These are the uh, isentropic process ratios that we can use for any one of the. Uh, parts of the stroke that we need to calculate there. So, just so you've all got them, there you go. So, we'll do an air standard model where the compression ratio is 8. The um, Top dead center vol sorry, bottom dead center volume is 400 centimeters cubed. Um, this is uh, this is another thing those car guys throw around, but not in metric. Yeah. You get beat up. You get beat up at the bar if you set it in metric. The temperature at that point is 290K. The pressure is one bar, and the pressure is really on in that bar if you're doing this in metric. And the temperature at the end of the heat addition is 2200K. Think that's all the pieces. Oh, we can evaluate the specific heats at room temperature, 300K. So find, find the heat added that's QH and uh, we can do it on a total basis rather than a mass basis. The network the efficiency and I think that's all we need. That'll do. Oh, yeah, one other thing I can give you. Let's see, we've got that because that's up there. Chris, put that light back on if you would, please. Also find in this problem what's called the mean effective pressure, the MEP. The mean effective pressure on a on a PV diagram, we have this cycle. that represents our auto cycle. And we know from any cycle on a PV diagram that the area is the network. The mean effective pressure is the one pressure that would give you that same area. So the mean 
ineffective pressure then, of course, is found from the work net, setting the work net on those equal, and then finding the area of this imaginary, it's not really a cycle, it's more an area, a uh, net area that's the same. If you notice, that's just simply P delta V, which of course is uh, equivalent to the work. So that's the mean effective pressure. Gives us an idea, uh, sort of associated to the efficiency of the engine. And so I want you to find that as well. So, that's your, your job, you can uh, you can find out, uh, uh, you'll need to establish all the temperatures and get any of the state points that you need. Most of these can be looked up right out of the, out of the box or can be calculated. Well, use the, the cold air standard. And that will give you C sub P and C sub P right out of the tables. started, we can find, uh, we have T1, so we can find T2 from this first equation, because it's an isentropic process up to point 2. These relationships are for isentropic processes, so we can find T2. Once you find T2, you've got T3, so you can do the heat addition using C sub V delta T, and so on around the cycle. So for the first one done, there's a brand new auto cycle out in the parking lot waiting for it to catch. More power. First thing to do is probably find T2 and T4. Then you can find the heat addition and the heat rejection that way. You need the heat addition, of course, because that's part of the efficiency.
not the name of the van again, the one the VW Microbus. With the pop-up? Oh. And a bumper sticker. If this micro bus is rocking, don't bother not. Who needs tables? Anybody need tables? Yeah. Um, she'll probably send it. She needs a new car. Who wants a new car? An old mobile? Yeah. This is not your dad's old automobile. What do you drive? Why don't you drive your own car? Oh, my parents are. Do they know? I'm just going to send a little email link to the tape. A little, su little surprise for you, Mr. Welsh. He knows. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, someday. That's entropy. Yeah. All right, well, the rest of them aren't working. I know I can see you working, so. Any numbers you need to check on the way? Do you remember the 
one of the first times a long time ago the cop came up and he had his hand on top of your car, you put an RFID uh, tag right there. So they don't have to go black. I'll put it You can't because it's clear and my yeah. molecule thick. Uh, Plus nothing sticks in my car. Plus that's not my car. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. You want to check any numbers while you go along? Doesn't help to calculate any wrong and keep going. Can we get charged? That'll do for today. This is pretty too. Ooh, that's scary. Can't you round that off the other direction? T two. Yeah, that'll do. Put the point two on. Point two. Point two. So it's not that number. Quick, change it. Double. Okay. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? You're scaring me. One six sixty five point nine. It's like uh, what's that possessed car, Christine? Kirby. Yeah. Yeah, not Herbie. Herbie's not possessed. Herbie's awesome. Yeah. Okay, I can check numbers as you go along. Anybody got T2 you want to check? No sense still going if you get it. that wrong.
thousand and a thousand and a thousand again. Thank you. 
brand new car out in the parking lot. Your name on it. It's a Jeep Laredo. No, I don't think it's a It's a it's a Scion. Yeah, that's high. Because we're almost 
the the, uh, the pressure ratio is on the order of the volume ratio because K is 1.4. So they're comparable. T3 is given, T4, 
is about 9.58. So, uh, so it's not to scale. Four should be above two, but it's just a cartoon. Um, the mass which you can get from the ideal gas law at point one, we know enough stuff there, 4.8 times 10 to the minus quart kilograms. <clears throat> so that makes everything else just a matter of C sub V delta T. QH with the mass and C sub V delta T should be 0.53 kilojoules. That's the heat added. What, Bill? What? 